Hi everyone, my name is Jesus Rodriguez. I'm the editor of uh, the website uh, Orinoco Tribune that is based in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be in this webinar. Thank you for organizing the webinar. And I want to also say respect to all of you, at least the ones that has been uh, on the streets fighting against the, 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 the terrible U.S. racist system. So I want to uh, start my, my, my speech uh, talking about the U.S. sanctions. Mm. I have to tell you that the sanctions against Venezuela started since the very moment Hugo Chavez took office in 1999. There were different kind of sanctions, aggressions, boycotts, blockades, and things like that. But more formally, in uh, 2014, uh, President Obama signed the first executive order declaring Venezuela an unusual an extraordinary threat to the U.S. That executive order set up the framework for all the legal actions that the, the, the U.S. regime has started since that moment. And immediately it has an impact in, against Venezuela, especially in international finances and PDVSA uh, operation abroad. PDVSA is our old company. So uh, those were the two, the two sectors most impacted by the executive order uh, of Obama. And then uh, uh, risk agencies, corporations that affect the, the, uh, the, the chances of a country to get loans, international loans, and things like that. But in 2017, now with President Trump, mm, uh, the situation got worse with the freezing and looting of Venezuelan assets abroad and bank accounts abroad, and also uh, with the criminalization of the CLAP program. The CLAP program is a CLAP designed by President Maduro in 2013 to provide very low uh, price uh, food, almost free. Uh, for uh, millions of Venezuelan households that were at that moment uh, very affected by, by what we call the economic warfare, which was somehow the result of the uh, U.S. sanctions that are uh, promoted by local uh, economic actors in Venezuela that promoted scarcity, hoarding, and things like that. Uh, so, from that moment, uh, uh, there are also other kinds of sanctions related to commercial flights that were uh, suspended by the U.S. between each country, between Venezuela and the U.S. Uh, sanctions against direct TV that happened, that, that happened this year during the pandemic, while many Venezuelans uh, were inside their houses not knowing what to do. And the only thing that they most of them got was direct TV. And, and then from one day to the other, AT&T that owns direct TV uh, announced that due to U.S. sanctions, uh, they were suspending the operations in Venezuela. And they shut up the operations that same day. Um, recently, that situation has been fixed somehow. They have been resuming, but that, those are the kind of sanctions that are not the big ones that you hear in the media all the time, but uh, that also affect many Venezuelans, millions of Venezuelans. The case of Direct TV is amazing because the number of subscribers that they have in Venezuela, uh, some people calculate that uh, might affect about like, like between six and eight million Venezuelans that directly or indirectly watch the rest of me. You have to know that Venezuela have about 30 million people. Um, now, from there, we go to financial services like sale, 
that are used by many Venezuelans transfer wise uh, and, and things like that, that are somehow connected also to US sanctions directly or by over confinement, how it is called by the experts. So, so the, 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 the level of the sanctions goes reach everything. Um, now, uh, in most uh, this year, we uh, were facing uh, scarcity of gasoline, and that's also a, a direct result of U.S. sanctions because we did not have access to spare parts to repair refineries uh, and to buy uh, additives, chemicals that are needed for the process of producing gasoline in our refineries. And uh, most recently, actually this last week, this week, I mean, uh, the US and some US pro-US media has been talking about possible new sanctions against diesel in Venezuela. And that is also very bad and, and, and it's a clear evidence uh, on how criminal the US regime is because diesel is mainly used uh, for uh, transport, and I mean buses or big trucks that transport food. So basically, if they do that, they are saying, we just want you to start you to death. So, so that's basically uh, what is happening in terms of sanction. I'm trying to be very brief in order to not exceed the 15 minutes that I have. Uh, now I want to try to connect those sanctions with COVID-19. I have to tell you that uh, since the very beginning, President Maduro addressed the COVID-19 situation in a very radical and proactive way that I believe is very respected by the majority of the Venezuelans, uh, even non-Chavistas, I believe that respect how uh, President Maduro has been handling the, the, the COVID situation, the pandemic in the country. Disregarding that in recent weeks, we have been uh, recording some uh, high, uh, uh, higher number of cases and, and deaths in the country. But it's nothing in comparison to what is happening in other South American countries. So, in this particular area, I wanted to mention that the season of our assets abroad, like Citgo, like Monomeros, Citgo is one of the biggest oil companies in the U.S. Monomeros is the biggest uh, petrochemical uh, company in Colombia, uh, and those companies have a uh, we're talking about billions of dollars of value. Not to mention the revenue that they produce for Venezuela. Uh, the sanctions are directed against the PDVSA, against the oil production in Venezuela. And Venezuela is a country that relies mostly on oil revenues. So they are basically trying to strangulate or suffocate Venezuela, uh, uh, closing the main source of income uh, for the country. So of course that uh, uh, have a direct impact in the capabilities of the government to procure medicines, to procure things needed to uh, address more properly the, the pandemic. Uh, besides that, as I already mentioned, the gasoline shortages that we experimented uh, 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 yeah, a few weeks ago uh, were, uh, all, are also a result of the U.S. sanctions. And uh, for example, ambulance, first responders, doctors, nurses use gasoline to, to to, to commute from their residents, from their homes to their workplaces. Uh, so that 
is a clear indication on how criminal the U.S. sanctions are, especially because even uh, with the U.S. knowing that this is happening, that we had shortages as a result of their sanctions, uh, they tried to block threatening with uh, military actions uh, five Iranian tankers that arrived in Venezuela by late May and the first days of June, I believe, uh, uh, that helped us reduce the problem with the gasoline, but we still have the problem. The problem has, has resumed somehow. The government says that it's going to get better because we receive uh, a lot of uh, additives that are needed to, uh, for the refining process from Iran, but we also uh, decided to try to switch our technological uh, refining capabilities technology uh, to the one used by Iran, and Iran is going to help us with that. We have to know that Venezuela is an oil producing country, not because we decided to be, but because the U.S. at the beginning of the 20th century uh, intervened in Venezuela and bought uh, most of the politicians, and they start producing uh, oil in the country and change our, completely our economic uh, situation uh, and all the refineries in Venezuela uh, are designed and use US technology so it's kind of complicated to deal with that kind of situation and switching uh, from that technology to other technologies but we are trying to do that we are actually doing that right now and I hope that eventually we will be able to stop the dependency on, on U.S. oil technology. So that's another evidence of the direct relations between the sanctions and uh, COVID-19. And of course, if we add to that what I already told you about the diesel possible next sanctions, uh, uh, we are in front of a clear uh, case for the International Criminal Court in which Venezuela already ha uh, have already filed uh, uh, a case against the U.S. for crimes against humanity due to the sanctions. So let's see what happened. It's not easy, uh, but we are trying, as I already told you, uh, to, to bypass those sanctions. And I believe that we are doing it pretty well no country is prepared to be uh, uh, in the you know, subject of this level of aggression, uh, of insanity. But we are trying to fight back, and that's what I want to tell you to end my, my words. Uh, with communal organization, uh, uh, we, as I already told you, uh, designed the club, and the club has been key uh, in these last years to, to fight back against U.S. sanctions, against blockade, uh, against economic warfare. Uh, also, in, uh, with that communal organization, a lot of school food programs, even during the pandemic, has been operational, because mainly because of our community organizations, what we call communal organizations in Venezuela. Uh, we are developing, as I already told you, our uh, technological solutions, trying to, uh, to, to, to avoid dependency from, uh, from abroad. And in that sense, we have been working uh, uh, in fixing medical equipment that before we needed uh, to hire companies from abroad, uh, repairing metro trains and equipment that is very affected by also by the U.S. sanctions that are uh, mainly, in our case, uh, France and Europe made. Uh, changing PDVSA, uh, U.S. or the dependency in technology, as I already told you, uh, with the help of Iran. So, so we are doing things to try to bypass, and eventually, if this, if this craziness uh, keeps uh, going on, we will get rid of the U.S. dependency 
and that is going to be great for us. Uh, and just to finish, uh, we have strengthened, strengthened in recent years our alliances with different countries that are not submissive to the U.S. imperialism, like Cuba, like Russia, like China, Iran, Turkey, and many other countries that are uh, subjected to U.S. sanctions. And we're talking about almost 40 countries in the world. That means that, that, that is like more than 20% of the countries worldwide that are eventually, if this path, if this pattern continues, the U.S. is going to have half of humanity of the countries in the world under sanctions. And that will be great because those countries, uh, sooner or later, are going to decide to do the same thing. Uh, that we are doing, that the Iranians already uh, did years ago, that the Cubans have been doing in, in talking about Cuba. I have to tell you that with the help of Cuba, for example, we have been able to address the, the COVID-19 situation um, more properly. We are talking about thousands of Cuban doctors in the street of most of the cities in Venezuela, helping the Venezuelan healthcare, uh, first responder healthcare uh, practitioners uh, to deal with the COVID situation. So that's something uh, very important connected to what I'm telling you, to getting uh, 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 alliances with countries that are friendly to you and that do not subject neither to U.S. imperialism. So this is what I wanted to tell you. I want to thank you for the invitation again. And I want to invite you to visit Orinoco Tribune and to help us get better. Uh, and uh, good luck to everyone. Bye-bye.